when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he proved that he was not just another prophet, but the God of the prophets. Our key scripture, and if they have it, it would be great if we can run with these uh, on the screens. From John 11, 25 and 26, where the Lord Jesus says, I am the re to Martha, the sister of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And in verse 26, he says, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So the title of this morning's message is, do you believe? He asked Martha the question, and it echoes through the centuries. Do you and I truly, really believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Um, let me go through. Since we just saw a skit with Joseph of Arimathea, I'll bring fast forward this point I was going to share later. The Bible tells us that Joseph, he had to be quite an affluent man had this brand new tomb hewn out of the rock, obviously uh, like a sarcophagus for himself and his family members. It would have cost a lot of money. So this is an imaginary conversation now, fiction based on fact. So Joseph comes to Pilate after the death of Jesus on the cross. And he asks for permission to take the body of Jesus and lay it in his newly hewn stone tomb. Now this is an imaginary conversation. Could have. And Pilate says, what, Joseph, really? You just spend so much of money on that newly hewn tomb for your family. And you're going to use it to lay the body of this crucified man in? And Joseph says, well, Pilate is just for the weekend. <laughs> okay, so here's, a, a, I'll share now a quote with you that we would call a conundrum in, in our English language. Jesus the Christ is the only man who created his mother before she conceived him. And you can throw up on the screen Colossians 1, 16, 17. For by him... All things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, and all things were created through him and for him. So everything and everyone was and is created by Jesus. So obviously, he created his mother before she conceived him. There are many prophecies in the Bible. Then there are some specific messianic prophecies. So the first ever messianic prophecy in the Bible is found in, a pastor can't answer this. Okay, it's in the first book of the Bible. In chapter, very good, it's good teaching. Chapter 3, verse, wow, this is the first church I'm preaching at, they got it all right. With muzzling the pastor, that's very good. Outstanding. Genesis 3.15, the first ever messianic prophecy God says to Lucifer, who came in the form of the serpent, let me throw this in quickly for biology uh, sake. When God said to the serpent, on thy belly shalt thou crawl, in that instant of time, the, the serpent lost its limbs. If you ever kill a snake, I'm not asking you to go find and kill one. I've killed a couple of co cobras here when I was young. If you dissect it, every serpent has the appendicular and pelvic girdles, but no limbs. Because when God said you will crawl on your belly, instantly it lost its four limbs. It did not uh, uh, atrophy because of evolutionary, uh, <laughs> you get where I'm going with that. So now, God says in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head and you will bruise its heel. On the cross, Satan Lucifer bruised the heel of the body of Jesus. But on resurrection day, when he arose from the dead, he crushed the head of the serpent. Now I want to bring out another point in this verse. God says, and God is always true. He's always right. He said, I'll put enmity between your seed and her seed. So one of the titles for the Lord Jesus is the seed of the woman. 
However, in biology, in zoology, a woman has no seed. But God cannot be wrong. He's always right. Hello? He's called the seed of the woman. Only the man has seed. That very first messianic prophecy is predicting way back from 6,000 years ago or 4,000 before the Messiah was born that Jesus the Christ would never be sired by a corrupt, sinful, earthly, human father. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost. He could not be called the seed of a corrupt man. And no offense meant any of us who are fathers, we are all corrupt, fallen, sinful human beings. Jesus was never sired by a fallen human being. So he's the seed of the woman. Luke 135. Look what the, what the word of God says. The angel Gabriel says to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that holy one, I like the way the old King James says it, that holy thing that shall be born will be called the Son of God. Seed of the woman, but Son of God. Proverbs 30 verse 5 says, Every word of God is pure. Every word of God is pure. When God says seed of the woman, that's exactly why. As Mary, now Gabriel makes the announcement to Mary. As Mary received the word of God and believed the word of God, she conceived the word of God. I'll say it again. As Mary received the word of God and believed, acted on the word of God, then she conceived, brought forth that son of God. I said, Holy Spirit, how does that apply to your children, to us? He says, we all know that God has a special, specific, unique, clear calling on every single one of our lives. We are not planted on this earth by accident. And as you have heard the call, the voice of God to you in your heart, in your mind, as you've received that call, and as you believe it in your heart, Romans 10 and 9, then you will conceive or bring forth that call of God upon your life. At the birth or the incarnation of Jesus, Oh, just one other scripture there, forgive me. John 1, 14. It says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's when Mary conceived the word of God. Now, at the incarnation of the birth of Jesus, a perfect man, there were only two perfect men that have ever walked this earth. The first was Adam, a.k.a. the first Adam. The second is Jesus, a.k.a. the... Ah, I was waiting for you to get tripped up. There's no such phrase as the second Adam in the whole Bible. Because if you have a first Adam, if you have a second Adam, you can have a third Adam and a fourth avatar. The Bible, stick with the word of God. There's a first Adam and a last Adam. There's no in-between Adam and there's no future Adam. Every word of God is pure. So there's only two perfect men that ever walked this earth. The first Adam, who sadly blew it. And that's why we needed the last Adam. So now, at the incarnation or the birth of Jesus, a perfect man, that last Adam, and perfect God met is not 50% man, 50% God. Jesus is 100% man, 100% God. So at the incarnation of Christ, a perfect man and perfect God met. And at the cross, that perfect man who became sin and perfect God split. Psalms 22 verse 1. David prophesying says, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? 
Matthew 27, 46, where the Lord himself quotes this. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? Have you considered that for those, that span of three days and three nights, there was a temporary separation in the eternal Godhead? Thank God it was just temporary and short-lived. Think about the agony that God Almighty went through to redeem us and bring us back to himself. But then we know the grave could not hold him. Death could not destroy him. He broke the chains of sin and death and hell. Revelation 118, please. And he defeated Satan on his own turf. And we read, Jesus says uh, in Revelation 118 to John, the beloved apostle, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and hell. You know, your Ruthie is somewhere here. Where is she? I took off my glasses. Where's Ruth? Wave at me, sweetie. Suppose dad and mom are not home and you come back from school or college or whatever. Do you have a way to get into the house? I'm not talking about grandpa and grandma. <laughs> Do you have a way to get in the house? I hope so. How would you get in? You have a spare key. I don't have a spare key to your parents as you do. Which means you have the authority. The power to enter that house in the absence of your parents. When Jesus says, I have the keys legally till the point that the price was paid for the sins of humanity. Legally, Lucifer had those keys or that authority. But when the price was paid and God's divine justice was satisfied, Satan lost the authority completely. I like the way one preacher said when, when Jesus went down and, and, and he was tormented for our sakes and then he overcomes, he says to the devil, the keys man, hand me those keys. And Satan had no legal, he has from that moment on no legal authority over you and I because Jesus has the keys of death and hell, praise God. He arose triumphant, victorious, conqueror, and now today we follow in his triumphant trail. He's got umpteen titles. One of them is that he is the captain of our salvation, Hebrews 2.10. He is the captain of our salvation, for it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through their sufferings. And this is the... I try to humanize it, you know, how for us to relate. He's the captain of our salvation. He is the only heavenly five-star general there is. That's just a simple way to put it. He is the captain of our salvation. And we have the honor and the privilege, the easy part, to follow in his wake behind him. While we follow in his triumphant trail. Captain of our salvation. Psalm 46 verse 11. So we need to realize, when I say realize, not just understand, but appropriate in our hearts and minds to realize who we are following. The scripture says, the Lord of hosts is with us. And the God of Jacob, which is Israel, is our refuge. And I thought about it, the Lord of hosts. So here's the only Heavenly five-star general there is. And he's also the Lord of hosts. Now we understand, we've heard the word Sabbath. That's just the day of rest, the last day of the week. But one of the titles of God is Jehovah Sabaoth. That's not Sabbath. Sabaoth means hosts. He, Jesus, is the Lord of hosts. You know what a host is? I actually did a little research on this. In Revelation, John doesn't know how to describe it, so he talks about the hosts of heaven like 10,000 times, 10,000. That's like 100 million or whatever. That, that's all John in his, in his limited math. He just, that's all he said. But it's, here's, I like the way somebody else put it. Every person has a guardian angel. An angel looking out for you. Remember the time you nearly had a bad accident? A guardian angel was at work. 
If there are seven billion people on earth, there have to be at least seven billion angels. And counting. So just to give you a reassurance, Jesus is the Lord of Sabaoth. He is the Lord of hosts. The heavenly hosts and the armies of heaven. And, the, and Psalm 46, 11 says, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Which means nothing formed against you can prosper. When the Lord of hosts is on your side. Doing the fighting and fighting the battles for you. Now, I have to go back being a teacher to a little bit. Middle school algebra. This was the easy algebra, believe me. When we were first introduced to simple equations. We're not talking about quadratic. We learned, I remember, if x plus y equals 12, and if x equals 5, y must be 7. If x equals 3, y must be? Either you're good students or I'm a good teacher to something. No. Now, every promise of God is conditional. God says in his word, let's throw that verse up also. Uh, Isaiah 119, if you are willing and obedient, he's talking to his people, to us. If we are willing and obedient, then we will eat the good of the land. So I see the if then, every promise of God is conditional. He's not going to just pour his blessings. We have withheld when he was young some blessings from our only son. Because when he was disobedient, he didn't get the blessing. Now you know how many times we've said to him, Oh, son, if only you'd been obedient, you have no idea what mom and dad would have done for you. So the same cry goes out to us as children of the Most High God. If we will but be willing and obedient, we will eat the good of the land. He's waiting to pour out his blessings upon his obedient children. So if we're obedient, then we shall eat the good of the land. If X is 3, then Y is 9, right? However, I love this. When it comes to Christ himself, it's not an if then, it's a when then. Follow me with these scriptures. When then, when it comes to Jesus Christ. Luke 21, 28. Now when things began to happen, begin to happen, look up. Lift up your heads. Oh, this is the New King James Version. You'll have to pardon me. I'm, I turned 60 in January. They've told me I'm officially an old senior citizen now in India. So I'm looking for my discounts. Now, but I use the old King James Version. So let me just give it to you from the old King James. And when these things come to pass, the Lord is talking about his return. When these things come to pass, then look up. Lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. When this happens, then watch out. John 6:14. And even though that's up on the screen, I'll read the old King James if you'll allow me to. John 6, 14. When they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, then those men said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When then? When then? Number three, John 8, 28. John 8, 28. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am He, and I do nothing of myself, but as the Father taught me. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know I am here. Now the fourth one in this series of when then is for us on this particular morning. John 20, 20. And when he had so said, he showed to them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad. When they had heard these things, uh, when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. Then, so when Jesus comes, a beautiful old hymn I used to sing. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, all tears are wiped away. You can Google the song. When Jesus comes, then we are glad. When Jesus comes, all tears, all sorrows are gone. All sins are washed away. When Jesus comes into our heart. So when Jesus comes, we have the when then effect. There's five phases as I see it in the life and mission of the Lord Jesus. Number one, his nativity or birth. 
incarnation, nativity. Number two, his humanity or ministry, which includes his service, serving, teaching, preaching, healing, miracles. So we have his nativity, his humanity in ministry, Gethsemane. I encourage us to separate Gethsemane from Calvary as two completely very separate experiences. Gethsemane was the emotional crucifixion of Jesus. Calvary was the physical crucifixion of Jesus. Personally, I can't say the Lord, but I, I feel that Gethsemane was more excruciating for Jesus than Calvary. You can understand a person bleeding when they are lashed, but a person sweating drops of blood without a lash touching your body, that must be something else. His nativity, his humanity and ministry, Gethsemane. It's hard for me to think about Gethsemane without breaking up. Then Calvary. And then, today, victory. He is risen from the dead. In John eleven twenty five, 25, we go back to that scripture. Jesus says to Martha, I am. I am, I am the resurrection and the life. He or she that believes in me, though they were dead, yet they will live, and whoever believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This question, we ha every human being has to answer, either to our eternal salvation, or we reject it to our own peril. I want to touch on when Jesus says, I am. There are about 18, 1, 8 I am's of Jesus in the New Testament. Recorded in the New Testament. I'm not counting those that are repetitive. 18 I am's. I thought about this. Why does God speak of himself as I am? He is the great I am. Now, in English... If somebody asks you, who are you? You don't say, I am. It's actually pompous. But God described himself as, I am. He said to them, when before Abraham was, I am. It doesn't make grammatical sense. But yet it's accurate. So, back to Exodus 3.14. When Moses is standing before the burning bush. And God wants him to go back and bring out the Israelites from Egypt. And finally he says, but who shall I say is set me? And God says, and pardon me, I'm going to quote the old King James again. Normal grammar would say, I am who I am. The old King James says, I am that I am. And as an English student, I thought, again, that does not make sense. Now, first of all, in English grammar, the phrase I am, as the name of God, hear me now, is the present, perfect, continuous sense. Sounds like God, don't you think? <laughs> He's present, perfect, continuous tense. He's not was, not will be. He always is. He is the great I am. Now in Exodus, God says, I am that I am. Please pardon my age. Okay, that's the old King James. I am that I am. I could not rest. We have to understand this. So in the Old Testament, God the Father dis defines or describes himself as I am. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord I change not. I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who brought thee out of Egypt. I am, I am. So God the Father calls himself I am. In the New Testament, like 18 times, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. On and on, right? So God the Father calls himself I am. Jesus calls himself I am. What is this that? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> In Acts chapter 2. Which is a fulfillment of the minor prophet Joel. The Holy Spirit is poured out on the 120 in the upper room. And Peter stands up for the 11. By the way, that's the one time cricket is mentioned in the Bible. By then Judas had hanged himself. So Peter stood up for the 11 and was bold. <laughs> that's really bad. English teacher, that's what you get. But he was filled with boldness, praise God. Now, and he, the people thought that the 120 were drunk. And Peter says, 
Men and brethren, we are not drunk as you suppose. But this, that's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit without measure. This is that. This is that. Which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. But we need the, uh, the witness of at least two, more than one to make it solid, right? So I'll give you one more verse around that. Uh, so Acts 2, 16, he says, this is awesome. Whoever that was was on the ball. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Watch this. Paul the apostle. So Peter speaks on the day of Pentecost. Now Paul the apostle says, now the Lord is that spirit. That that is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God. So back, way back in Exodus 3, 14, Moses standing before the burning bush, not understanding what we do now, God says, I am that I am. Father, Holy Spirit, Son, every word of God is pure. Now I have a little exercise, mental gymnastics for us. Try now thinking back to your first ever memory. I was about four when I got pierced by a little thorn in the garden. I honestly can't think before that. I guess I was a bit slow. Maybe some of you remember mommy holding you in her arms. I cannot remember that. Can you remember? Some people say, I remember when I was in the womb. Wow, let me salute you. <laughs> we can only think back to a certain point and your mind goes tilt. Correct? True or false? Don't worry. You know why? God says, don't worry. You can't remember beyond that? I am that I am. Now just do some gymnastics the other direction. Go forward. Maybe you live to, to 105. <laughs> okay, whatever. And then how, how much further can you think? You live to a ripe old age or the, the trumpet sounds. You step into eternity either way. And one year... 10 years, but that's eternity. How much can you think? How far can you think into eternity? You come to a point where your mind goes tilt again, right? Don't worry. God says, I am that I am. <laughs> he always is. He's not bound by time like we are. I am, Jesus says to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live do you believe this, Martha? The question is to us, do you and I believe this? Little exercise or thought. When our son Luke was about knee high to a grasshopper, that's about two. We taught him certain things. Son, where's mom? He'd point to his mom. Where's dad? Now, even adults, watch closely. He'd point to his dad. And where's Jesus? Too many people point like there. No. He's here. We taught him to point to your heart. Don't we teach our children? Into my heart. Come in. Not into my head. That's where the problem lies. That's the block. Come into my heart. And so where is Jesus? Here in my heart. Revelation 3.20, I want to close with this one verse. To all our friends and visitors. It is awesome to so many visitors. Lord Jesus, and I'm sure we have seen paintings on an ELS or CLS calendar, you know, or maybe in a stained glass window. A painting or a picture of the Lord Jesus holding a lamb with a shepherd's staff and knocking on the door. That comes from this scripture, Revelation 3.20, where the Lord Jesus himself is personally making an appeal. And he says, behold, listen, I stand at the door and knock. That's painted as the door of a house. What he really means is the door of your heart, of my heart. I was 17 when I heard this. Please hear me, people, friends. Behold, listen, I'm standing at your heart's door and knocking. If you can hear me knock, and if you will open the door of your heart, I will come in. Let me ask you a question. Can Jesus tell a lie? Can he tell a lie? No, it's impossible. Thank you, kid. Awesome. Somebody's teaching him right. He cannot lie. 
So listen to me, my friend. If you're not saved, if you're not born again as uh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were talking about, if you've never made that opening of your heart for Jesus to come in, he says, he is saying, I'm quoting him, if you hear me knocking right now, and if you will open your heart, I will come in. He cannot lie, right? So if you open your heart and ask him to come in, what will he do, come in or not? He will come in. Now here's my punchline. If I open my heart and say, Lord Jesus, come in. He comes in. Once he comes in, how is it possible for me to go to hell? Answer that question. If he's in my heart, how is it possible for me to go to hell? So please don't say, Pastor Ashish, that preacher is so arrogant. He's sure he's going to heaven. (laughs) Only because I know I invited Jesus to come in. Amen. I would like to invite us now in closing. I know many of us have made Jesus our personal savior. But there are many visitors. And there are some who are on the fence. So even if you know Jesus as your savior, would you pray with me for the sake of all the others too? And I appeal to every person in the sound of my voice, or whether it's being broadcast, you can pray this right now, right where you are. Would you do that? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and follow me? Repeat this prayer, simple prayer after me. Lord Jesus, please repeat it after me. Let's do it aloud so the others, not to, just just say it out so the others are encouraged to to pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for coming to this world, living a perfect life, going to the cross, shedding your precious blood to wash away my sin and dying in my place Lord Jesus I believe that on the third day you rose again right now I hear you knocking on my heart's door I open my heart come into my heart Lord Jesus be my Savior and my Lord Thank you for making me your child. Thank you for saving me and writing my name in the book of life in heaven. Amen. Friends, Pastor Ashish, please do come. If you made that that decision for the first time in your life or you were a fence sitter, Pastor Ashish is here. I will be here. Pastor Jaikam, I will be here. Other elders are here. Please don't leave without that complete assurance. Thank you, Thank you Andrew. Let's put our hands together. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website, apcwo.org, for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.